Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening right now on iTunes, please go and leave a five-star review. I'll be reading the best reviews every week, so long as they are five stars. They can be creepy. They can be flirty. They could be, it could be a message in code, whatever it is. So long as it's five stars, I want to see your reviews because I'm going to read them and, uh, you know, slip your phone number in there, whatever you want to do, as long as it's five stars. Also very excited to talk about my sponsor, Silk City Hot Sauce. Um, I know I've talked about in previous episodes that I'm going to try this fire cider, bubonic tonic. They, they sent me a ton of stuff. I was never into hot sauce prior to them. I was raised very much in a white family on a noodles and butter diet, a lot of blandness happening. So I'm new to this hot sauce world. I mean, it's new for me. So I'm trying a little bit here by, here and there. I like the taco seasoning one. If you go to silkcityhotsauce.com and use the code CMP, you're gonna get 15% off your whole order. And they're gonna throw in a bottle of this cherry sriracha and a bunch of stickers. Oh, Jesus Christ. Wow, you drink it. Oh, it's a uh, bubonic tonic. Holy fuck. It's maple syrup, hot peppers, ginger, garlic, cider. This is going to put hair on your chest. I'm sure there's a medicinal oh. value for this. All right. More on that later. I can't, I'm so excited to introduce my guest. Uh, I've been dying to have him ever since I started this little podcast. Um, he is one of the hosts of Jim and Sam on Sirius XM. He's also uh, the co-host of UFC Unfiltered with Matt Sarah, Jim Norton. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> How Hi, are Chrissy. you? I'm good. How are you? I, by the way, I love watching you drink that. You're, you got, uh, you're braver than I am. I, I don't think I would drink hot sauce. Fire cider. I don't think this is hot sauce. Oh, that's a bubon- the, Oh, it's a tonic. It's meant to be drunk. Yeah. Oh my oh, God. Okay. Can you imagine if I just was throwing back hot sauce? <laughs> That's why I thought you just drank hot sauce. I'm like, wow, she's pretty brave. That would be like Hillary Clinton levels of, of trying. Of uh, pandering, yeah. Of pandering. I was going to say pandering, but then I was like, well, what if Jim likes Hillary Clinton? I don't know. No. And what, if I did, too bad for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tough shit. Tough shit. Um, I, uh, I want to talk about the, the, the tournament of laughs on TBS. Okay. Are you happy? For your bud, Chip. Are you happy you know, with how he did? I am. I, I was shocked that it went that far. Like, my manager p- pitched it to me, and I'm like, well, I'll do it as Chip. That's it. Like, I'll, I, I'd be fine. I didn't think they'd say yes to it. And the fact that Chip got to make a little bit of money and got to do videos that got on television, I think it would be fun for the radio show. But then I'm, like, up against, I mean, you know, they're all funny comics that Chip beat. So uh, it became like a real thing. But yeah, I was very happy uh, with the fan reaction and the Chip fans voting. And it was so silly. And the videos were ridiculous. And I told this to Sam, not one new Chip fan was gained. Th- that All that, that shit was... What? No, 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 it was all inside jokes for people who already liked Chip. Like, if you were a fan, you probably loved it. But people who weren't fans are like, what the fuck is this? There was nothing done to gain new fans. I just wanted to entertain people who already liked stupid Chip. That made me laugh more to do that. Yeah, it's just like fun for the sake of fun because yeah. I always enjoy, I know that Chip had, I don't know, some of the fans of his started these these groups. Well, that, well like if somebody's going live, the Chip fans always seem to find this person going live <laughs> and they'll, they'll like sort of force a kind of couch discussion or like a couch auction they're always there like and they'll start asking like a random person how much is that couch behind you or how much is like it's usually a couch but it's always so fun to see them like get freaked out like why are you guys here but at the same time there's more people watching them than would ever have normally stumbled upon their their little uh live so do you think some of them are chip fans doing that i think so i think it's possible yeah, I think they definitely are, um, you know, and I, not to my knowledge, I don't think I've, I've seen anybody turn around and be like, you know what, fine. Yeah, I will sell this. Yeah. You know, give me 200 bucks. Sure. It's covered in dog shit. Um, do you feel like, and I don't know if you and Chip discussed this very much, but do you, do you feel like Piff the Magic Dragon deserved to win, even though he is a magician? You know, he does comedy too, and, and like, you know, uh, Chip was obviously extremely angry um, and was, was none too pleased. Um, it, I felt bad for the fans because the fans were voting for the whole thing. And um, I'll be honest, I, I never thought Chip was going to get past Tim Dillon or Gilbert. I mean, uh, you, you know, again, both of those guys are so respected. 
Um, and I thought it was very funny that the Chip fans just pushed Chip past everybody. So I, I think that for them to not to get to vote for that kind of sucked. But Pitt's videos were decent. I mean, when I looked at it, it wasn't like he just threw some dog shit together. Like, he literally did real videos. Um, and there was a beginning, middle, and end to them. So it was like, if Chip was going to lose, I would prefer that he at least lost to real videos. But, uh, you know, I felt the Chip probably, uh, you know, the Chip fans were very disappointed. I understood why. It's very disappointing. And because I, I was looking at who was in, like, the final, the final four, the final few, and I was like, man. I mean, I was like, I don't think Tim Dillon's going to win because, like, I just feel like he's too dark for the mainstream. Maybe, yeah. And um, so I was like, all right, this this Piff guy seems pretty much, like, you know, family-friendly-ish. I don't know. Yeah. Although I think Chip is pretty family-friendly. Chip didn't he- curse, but I wasn't surprised that Chip lost. Like, I, I mean, I was shocked Chip got that far. Um, and I felt that fan voting had been continued, that Chip uh, would have been uh, the victor, as Chip was very quick to point out as well. But I think that it would have uh, maybe that. I, I don't know why they decided not to do that. Maybe they just wanted to get the comics involved and fill the hour. I, I don't know. So there's some disappointment in the, in the fans there that maybe they uh, they got out a little too soon. They should have hung until the end and kept voting. Huh? That is well, the fan, no, well, the, that, that was TBS's decision to not allow people to vote for the last one. Oh, no, no, no. The reason that, that Chip yeah. lost is because... The, the fans voted Chip through all the way to the end. They weren't permitted to vote in the finals. That was voted on by comedians and I think maybe some TBS staff. That was not voted on by the fans. That's why the fans were so angry. Wow, which to me totally says like, oh, it's some other people and our staff. Like to me that says like, yeah, we decide, we picked the winner. Like we decided who we want to put I think in every, I, I think in every contest too, like every, and I, I don't know about last comic stamp, but I think there's always a thing, and I don't remember from this TBS deal, where it says at producer's discretion. I think producers always have a way out in any contest you do. Um, I, I think there's always a thing where the producers can kind of weigh in if they want to. Yeah, in case you, like, throw a dog out a window or something. Right, right, right. And the fans <laughs> love like, oh, it. <laughs> we're, not, we're not stand behind this guy. <laughs> or what, what was it that happened to Chip's dog? Oh, me. so many things, which, I mean... <laughs> There was so many, so many of Chip's dogs have been run over. Oh. Um, where he's walking the little rascal, and uh, the next thing you know, the leash is lighter, um, and the screams behind him. Oh, he's not pulling. He's so well behaved. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And goodbye. Um, <laughs> why do you think there was a hiatus in the Chip Chipperson show? You no, know, briefly. You know, I wasn't making any money doing it. And, and after a while, like anybody else, I go through depression, like, uh, you know, whatever. I'm a weird guy, like every other fucking comedian. So I think it was just, I just, I ran out with it. I ran out of enthusiasm to do it. Mm. Um, and then when the pandemic was started happening, it wasn't even about the money. It was just about like, hey, I'm kind I miss doing this. It was, I, I enjoyed doing this. And then we were doing it on Zoom, which felt like a whole new thing. I fucking hate asking people to be on my podcast. I mean, you know what a nightmare it is. Hey, you want to do my podcast? I fucking hate it. So now I got to do it all over again, but it's a little easier to get people on Zoom. Um, it just wasn't making, I wasn't feeling good doing it anymore. And then now that I'm doing it again, I love it. Because I started okay. doing Patreon and that gave me a whole new weird outlet to do all this weird video shit with Chip that I wouldn't have done. Um, and not being able to be creatively, have an outlet myself, it, it was a place to focus it that, that doesn't make me depressed because you know, like none of us can really do what we're doing. We're doing our podcast and shit, but you can't do real gigs. Yeah, it's very so, depressing. It's so yeah. easy to get depressed. It's so easy for the days to mush together. And you're yeah. like, what's the point of even putting on pants today? And then you put on your pants and you're like, I don't even fit into my pants anymore. When did I this know. happen? You know, what a fucking so fat so I'm turning into. I literally, oh, I, I can't stop fucking eating. Um, I just, <laughs> I can't. I, I still work out, but I can't stop fucking eating. So like everybody else, I've kind of turned into a fat fuck. Yeah, I'm res- I'm kind of like going back to my college days where like the meals sort of blend together. It's it's not good. Yeah, yeah. it's not good. But you know, it's like we're we're gonna snap back for sure. And I and I think because uh, I understand the feeling of like oh god, I don't want to ask somebody to do because Zoom is harder. It's like it's so much harder to do this than to be in person because like yeah. I've actually read articles about it is that like it's more tiring to do this than to do an in person interview because like. So, so much more of your attention is focused on like, oh, what what are they saying to me with their face? Right. You have to listen harder for it's the subtleties, you know, are, are just like, you know, it's it's a real pain in the dick. But um, yeah. 
you know, we're making it work. And I think it, yeah. people are happy to do, I think people are happy to do podcasts and happy to, you know, even though they're just appearances and not like paid stand up work. Okay. It's like, it's still, you're still talking to people. It's still content. You're still like, you know, keeping your, yourself out there. And kind are of- you at gas now at the actual facility? No, I just went to do Michael Mouse's show today, uh, but I'm still a compound. Uh, the, after 4th of July, all the compound shows, you know, they were like, okay, we're, you know, you guys should all really- Oh, you at compound right now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, have, okay. I have Wet Spot on Compound Media, which is every Monday at 7.30. And uh, it used to be eight, but you know, it's, the time shifted a bunch because in hot water, Gino and Aaron's show was shifted from the morning to be leaning into Anthony's show. Right. And so they swapped that up a little bit, but Malice has a show on both compound and gas. Okay. Um, so this was the first time I did uh, Malice's show. Where are you right now? I'm saying right now you're in compound. Oh, right now I'm in my yeah. apartment. Yeah. Oh, I, I meant right now. Like that doesn't look like compound. Your setup looks good. Wow. Uh, thank you. I, yeah. I like how that looks. I have, um, this is a regular light. I put a pink light bulb in it because you know what yeah. I've done is I observe a lot of YouTubers and I observe, you know, I'm like, what, a, what can I learn from these fucking sure. crazy dickheads? And I'm like, all right, their lighting is pretty good. And so now I have a pink light here on the side wow. and then a pink light here. And I have a big ring light coming at me. And this is all chalkboard in case I have a thought. I want to make a drawing. And this is, uh, these are gems. Very nice. So yeah, thank you. And I, you are somewhere tropical. Kind yeah, of. I'm in front of the, this is the uh, wallpaper in uh, Frank Lopez's office in Scarface. <laughs> if you remember when uh, Tony went in and shot Frank Lopez, that's where, the, that's where this wallpaper is from. It's really awesome. They're like, I'm gonna kill somebody in the back. Yeah. Um, okay, so what do you think, what are your reactions to comedians and also just regular people who seem to, who just don't get chip who don't understand chip you know i get that too i think comedians i think most people comedians i think get him and some like him and some don't like i was always amazed by who like like colin loves chip uh geraldo used to love chip it was a weird uh patrice would be annoyed by chip so chip would annoy patrice while he was doing college sports shit on fucking uh twitter and then I would just start chip tweeting him and then people would be like, <laughs> just jumping in and it would wreck his conversation. I think he actually blocked chip at one point. Oh. Uh, he got annoyed. So yeah, I, I get why people don't like chip and I get why people uh, love him. But I think comedians get it. Some just decide they think it sucks. Um, regular people who don't get it. I mean, again, I don't even know if they don't get it or if they just don't like it. I understand both reactions. I get why people think it stinks too. The thing that is the saving grace of chip for me is because is that chip is not cute chip is a <laughs> dick like i could never do a cute character like like any length of time like you know chip is fucking like a, a bitter stupid fuck um mean uh self-hating and depressing but the fact that chip is not cute is how i feel very comfortable doing him uh but i think if chip was cutesy i would hate it I would hate Yeah, that. and nobody wants to watch a cute man do no. anything. You know, you want to watch a, <laughs> a, a funny man or like, or an, just an asshole for the sake of being an asshole, a boundary yeah. pusher. But like, he's he's silly. He's a goof, and it's like he can he can ask the tough questions too and be honest. And it's nice to like have all that going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan. Oh, um, what are your thoughts on the whole uh, New York City is dead debate? We talked about that today. And, and I'm, I'm in James Altucher, I know since fourth grade. I mean, we grew up together. Wow. So, yeah, 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 we used to play chess together. He would, of course, beat the shit out of me. In, uh, in, 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 we were childhood friends. So, and we reconnected later in life. So, I really love James. And I have not read his article yet because we're interviewing him Thursday. So, I was going to read it the night before because, you know, my memory has gotten so shit. That if I have to interview somebody, I'll read the stuff that tried to do that for. So I'm going to read James's article, and I want to read Seinfeld's response to it, um, and then James's rebuttal. So, but I think the one thing I've heard about it was that he he's talking about internet speeds, mm-hmm. and I don't believe New York is that. I think he's wrong, but I, I I do think that he's correct about internet speeds are going to make it a lot longer before people feel they need to go back to work because companies who the fuck wants to pay midtown rent 
if you can literally get 80% of your shit done at home. So it's going to have an effect. Yeah, I know for sure. I like, I have friends who, who have corporate jobs who, even though they can go back, they're just not because they don't want to be the only ones going back physically into the office when they know there's like the people who are legit really scared of the virus. And then I feel like there's a a lot of people who are like, well, just take advantage of the fact that I can totally fucking work from home. And I think a lot of people who can go back aren't going back and right. they're realizing, wow, this is really nice. Like people can watch their kids or do home stuff. I mean, everybody's been going to Home Depot and building, building decks. Maybe I'll build one off my fire escape, but. Um, yeah, it's a little home renovation. Yeah, I've gotten really into bird seed. I put a lot of bird seed on my fire escape. Um, that's Did what you I, show it's up? Like, it's a real old lady uh, yeah. <laughs> pastime I've adopted. Yeah, the birds show up. And then as do the squirrels and then the squirrels just like sit in the bird feeders and they don't, they don't let anybody else come in. I had a black squirrel and a gray squirrel and uh, the black squirrel, I'm not even making this up, like would, would loot. The black squirrel would put three and four nuts in its mouth and then try to run away. Then the, the gray squirrel just one at a time. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is, this is interesting. <laughs> Do you know who, by the way, do you know who loves squirrels? Bernard Getz. Bernie Getz has pet. You know, remember Bernie Getz or no? He's, uh, um, he's probably before I, your time. The name sounds so familiar. I don't know. The subway gunman. He oh, shot those four guys shit. on the subway in like, in like 89 or something. For, uh, they, were, they were like surrounding him. with like They said they were going to rob him. They had a screwdriver or whatever. And he pulled out a pistol and he shot all four of them. Um, but we've interviewed him years and years ago. And he's a big squirrel guy. Um, he's, he was in the paper recently. He's kind of nuts, <laughs> but he's fun to watch. He's nuts, said the squirrels. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Like James, you know, he he either is full owner or part owner of Stand Up New York. And same thing with Seinfeld. I mean, I look at both of them and I'm like, uh, I mean, you guys like have other places to go, All other right. homes. So it's not quite, it's not like they're, you know, toughing it out like with us down with the crackheads, you know, so I don't know. It's interesting. It's like you want to hope that anything can bounce back and and sure. uh, yeah, people are working more remotely, but it's like you lose something. You lose that in-person magic. You 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 miss like bumping into people. You miss yeah. like, you know, random meetings. So I think people just love being in New York. That, that's why I think New York will be okay because it, it, people just love being there. And it may be slow to come back and the businesses may change or the business models or they may have to lower rents to get people back. But uh, I think eventually it will come back. New York is not dead. I mean, I, I just don't believe that because I think people like being there too much. Are you, um, how are things going? It's serious. Like, do they have people back in studio over there? Not till January. Whoa, so we've known for a while that we're going to be doing, I mean, I, our producers will go in there to run the show and there's a couple of people going back in and out. But I, again, I don't even care. Like, I mean, I'm fine doing it from home. I miss the in-person interviews. Even if we did go back, they wouldn't be letting fucking guests come up. So it would just be me and Sam looking at each other. Like, I'm fine. It would actually probably be harder to go back right now because all of our guests would be like on Zoom. So me and Sam would be in a studio talking to a monitor. It would suck. At least we're all on equal footing in, in this kind of area, which I Yeah. Like. Yeah, it's true. You're not like trying to put your arm around a TV and be like, oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. And the timing is off that way. Like the timing when we're all on monitors is okay, but when... Like, I suck at phoners. Like, I've been doing radio for a long time. I stink at fucking calling in to a place and talking. I'm terrible at it. I'm never funny. Uh, I'm never good. I, I'm just, I'm really a stumbling and awful phone caller. So I prefer the visual as well. I, in studio, I love, but I, I, I hate making phone calls for radio shows. Wow. Are, are you, how's your, you know, worry level with the virus stuff? Or you're just like, let's just do with serious things, you know? I don't mind not going back, but I mean, I'm, 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 I'm mildly worried, but I think if you just kind of keep your distance, wear a mask, everybody's just kind of like, all right, we're fine. Like we just got to, everybody has a little common sense. That's all. I, I think people have lined up. You're either this or you're that and mm-hmm. fuck you. Like that's it's like, I don't know. Can't everybody just compromise and go like, uh, yeah, we don't need to be 40 feet away and we don't need to wear a space helmet. But a mask <laughs> in the elevator, all right, what the fuck? You know, how hard is that? I, but nobody wants to compromise. Everybody wants to be right. 
Yeah, it does seem like it's a, which side are you on? And I saw that in yeah. Maine, they were proposing that waiters and waitresses in Maine wear basically like an inverted dog, like a dog collar, pretty much. Like just a big old, like, I don't know why did they think that's somehow better. I've seen like masks that almost look like, you know, like attached to your chin, like a harmonica. Yeah, I've know. seen those too. They go up. I'm guessing that's to keep spittle from flying off you or to keep people from talking. I don't know. I mean, I, it is a weird one. Um, I, I just wear the regular disposable ones. And, right. they, you know, I, I feel, I don't feel like they're going to protect me if I'm face to face in a fucking peep booth with somebody. But I do think that if you're like you're at a reasonable distance and somebody coughs, it's less likely to blast out at me. Than <laughs> yeah. Me. That's all. Like the one that's open at the bottom, like the, you could, someone can cough into, you could yeah. go in and over the top. But then you hear these weird things like after 4th of July in New York, there was no spike. After the riots, there was no spike. And I'm like, mm -hmm. it's hard to debate that. Like, I don't know why there wasn't. I don't maybe I, yeah. I have no answer for it. So I, I don't every time I talk about this, I always have to preface it with I really don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. It's all guessing. It is hard to know. And like we've heard a lot that the numbers have been inflated. So it's also possible that perhaps a spike could have been not reported. I don't know. Maybe. If, yeah. It's possible too. Sure. If they want the numbers to look good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really trust any of them. I, I mean, I think Cuomo's done a reasonably good job and I despise de Blasio. Um, but I, I don't really trust anybody to, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just lucky that uh, Chip or chip wasn't in a nursing home because uh oh thank you oh, why he would have just coughed at everybody and fucking <laughs> and laughed um he would have coughed on all their fucking <laughs> coughed on their food yeah, as a goof not realizing he was spreading germs but he probably would have cleaned up because a lot of sex is happening in these nursing homes there's a lot of elderly chlamydia or whatever passing around so. i know i respect that you gotta you gotta love it the old people are just like whatever who cares we're gonna be dead in three years let's just fuck they're not wearing bags i, I love it i love it i love that the old people are just banging they're like, you know what? We're not going to get anybody pregnant. Let's yeah. do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jim, when did you when did you know that that Opie and Jim was not going to work out? You know, fairly, I always held out hope that Anthony would come back. I always wanted Ant to come back. And I remember Opie and I talked on the phone and we were like, look, we should let's just try it. We were still under contract at the time. Like, what do we do? I didn't want to leave. Because there was a part of me, I'll be that was a little afraid that they would rehire Ant, like after six months, and I'd be out, I'd be uh, gone. So I wanted to be there. Um, I always wanted Anthony to come back because I was never under an illusion that it was going to be as good without Anthony. I never wanted a replacement for Anthony. I wanted him. So I think early on, I kind of realized, like Opie and I don't. I think we just didn't have the on-air chemistry. Um, to make a show work. I think he knew it and I knew it early on. We did it. Um, it got, uh, it got bad towards the end, but I mean, it was like, Hey, we, we survived it. And you know, in our job, it's like, if you have a gig, it's hard just to walk away from a gig because I've been fired once. And I'm like, then what do you do? I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly the type of person who's getting a million TV opportunity. You know what I mean? Like I'm a stand up and I do radio and I do chip. I'm, I'm not a guy that fucking, gets on every roast on Comedy Central. I'm not in that particular club. I'm not a guy that gets all these, hey, we'd love to have you on this show or that show. So the fact that I had a gig that I really enjoyed, like I love talking, um, but I kind of realized early on, and I think he probably did too. We were like, we, we kind of knew. I don't like being in a position. I didn't care about the money difference because again, he had been there longer and he's Opie, so I was okay with that. But I didn't like being in an imbalance where my name was on the show. He called it, oh, we called it Opie with Jim Norton. I was very specific about that. I did not want Opie and Jim because hmm. it was Opie and Anthony. And I didn't oh, want wow. it to be a replacement. I said, I cannot, can be Opie with Jim Norton. Like I, I had to have a different feel to it. Um, but I didn't like the imbalance of, I, we both knew that he was 100% the boss. And I, I kind of didn't like that imbalance. And eventually it just, you know, we knew it was going to come to an end. How I think Open Opie recently tweeted that um, Chip is a part of Jim having mental illness. Does that feel like kind of a betrayal? No. Did he? Did he? <laughs> I, I I don't. I never read Twitter. Did he say that? Well, he's probably right. But I yeah, mean, it's also like, what he what he mistakes is Jim being funny. Yeah. Like it's Jim being funny. Like uh, to say that a comedian has mental illness. Well, yeah. 
I mean, uh, but is that a part of a mental illness? Sure. But Chip is funny. Chip yeah. is the, the goal of Chip is to be funny. And anybody who understands what funny is understands what the motive of that is. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what to make is a betrayal. No, I don't give a fuck what he says. I mean, who no. cares? And I think a lot of, a lot of comics are like, oh, I don't know, mentally ill. I feel like I'm mentally ill, but people only talk about it when something bad happens, you know, like, yeah, this mentally yeah. ill person shot up at school. Not like this mentally ill person got really far in a comedy contest. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the bottom line is chip makes people laugh. Like that's the goal of chip is to make people laugh. I mean, it's uh, chip is not supposed to make you think, uh, Chip is not anything other than ridiculous. He's a ridiculous caricature of certain unfunny personality traits that people have. Do you know what I mean? It's like you, there are people that are as unfunny for real as Chip is in parody. There are people who, uh, whose idea of a good comeback is, no, you are. Like there are really <laughs> people like that. Like it's, it's, it, Chip is not from Mars. So it's funny to hear that, uh, but I'm glad he's paying attention. Good. Yeah, because I think it's really, I think that's part of why Chip went so far. It's really refreshing for people now to see a, a comic or, or comedic personality that is just supposed to make you laugh. Whereas like more and more comics get like sort of, especially when it's close to an election, maybe more sucked up into, you know, being on one side or the other politically, and, yeah. you know, it's like, it's even something I have to watch sometimes, you know, sure. it's, it's just at the end of the day, like, all right, is my Twitter feed, like, is it still mostly jokes? Cause that, that should be my priority. Yeah, it's hard to, you know, it's funny. Chip is nonsense. And I think that's why people like him. Cause when you look at the tweets that people, even when the fans, you know, you're a fucking piece of garbage. Like it's just, <laughs> it's an excuse for utter nonsense and no, nobody takes it seriously. It's just stupid. But yeah, it's tempting. Like it's hard for all of us to not, do it like we all want to do it especially when you're on a podcast or a radio show because you're talking for two hours or an hour but yeah it's really hard i try that's why i've really been off twitter for like four months and it's because this whole thing this is a publicist thing like well you interact with your audience what the fuck does that even mean interact with your audience and that's that's not what a performance is like a performance is to do something you want the audience to laugh which would be a like i guess or a retweet but I don't need to read people's comments. Who gives a fuck? Oh, you know what I mean? Well, I don't run with Trump. Fuck you. Who gives a shit? Like, I don't, I, I don't, I didn't sign up to have a 24 hour a day interaction with people. Like, I don't, yeah. and, and it wasn't even what got me to stop checking. And I literally have checked app mentions maybe once or twice in four months. Wow. It was because I was hating what I was becoming. It was this, it becomes a drip. It becomes like this fucking, this thing, this red, is it good? Even when it's good, even, it doesn't always, a lot of times it's good. It's not, a, you know, more times than not, it's good. Yeah. It's easy to mute shitheads and get a bunch of positive, but then like how much fucking positive feedback? Like I just started getting annoyed at my fucking neediness. Like who gives a shit, you needy asshole? You're 51 years old. Like the fuck are you doing? We Look, they, they like it. my thing. They like it. Is it liked? Like, I just started to be disgusted with how I was checking it. I, I was getting annoyed at myself. Yeah, I've known comedians who will delete tweets if they don't get a certain amount of likes over, like, within an hour or something. And it's like, okay, yeah, now your life is uh, is focused around this thing and obsessed and like, and I and I think why people, you know, showbiz people are like, oh, interact with your fans. It's because like with social media in the last few years. Enga things like engagement has become, you know, so valuable. Like, oh, is that, what are your numbers like? What are the stats, the followers? It's like all that stuff I, they think equates to, you know, people in the seats at shows or viewers on TV. So I think that's why, but it does, it turns you into a person who's like obsessed. Like I get, I get wrapped up too. And then I, I, I see the good comments and I'm like, oh, well, they don't, they're only saying that because they don't really they don't really know me or they haven't seen like the more they watch the less they'll probably like me but i've always heard that i guess good advice for that is like when you get good feedback is to like lower you know have that not mean so much so that when there's really bad comments that but those also don't mean as much but it's like easy to say hard to do it is hard to do but i figured that like the if i tell a joke if i tweet a joke or whatever and one of the reasons i've kind of stayed away from 
things I was doing before and focused on Chip is because this whole thing is so weird. It's, it's, it's not as frustrating for me because I'm doing stuff that I wasn't doing before and weird. So it's like your creativity gets focused in a weird way as opposed to feeling like, fuck, I miss stand up so much. I miss this so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing things like, it, it, I feel like things are unfolding with this dumb chip. So it's like, it, it keeps you creatively thinking in a way that, where you don't feel stagnant. Um, but I know that once things come back and I'm doing stand up again, I'm, I'm sure I'll be involved with it again. But I don't need, like when, when you tell a joke and people laugh, that's the feedback, beginning, middle, and end of it. Like, I don't like when they groan. I've said that to crowds for 30 years. I don't, what are you groaning for? You have two options, laugh or stare. That's it. <laughs> I don't need your fucking feedback. Like, I don't need the feedback of, oh, hey. Like, I don't care if you, or if you didn't agree with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, like so this I, is what you're presenting. It's either yes or no. You as an audience member are not allowed to go, no, how about make this turn? Or how about do this? Yeah, I'm not interested. And I'm like, when you watch a movie, you watch the movie. It's a performance. Like, it's not an interactive thing unless it's dinner theater. The only interaction with a comedian is the laugh. How, we, we, hecklers, we hate hecklers. Nobody likes hecklers. I mean, we'll make the most of them. But uh, by and large, we fucking hate them. They're annoying. They're not helping. Yeah, they're trying to throw you off course. They're yeah. trying to, like, be a bump in the road. Most of them secretly want it to be about them and yes. probably wish that they were on stage. It's Agree. like, or it's like some girl whose boyfriend hasn't paid attention to her all night. And like now she's drunk and now it's her chance to yep. take the focus back. Now she wants all the boyfriend's attention in the whole yeah. room. But I really that, miss that too. You do miss it. It's like, I even miss, yeah, I even miss the hecklers. And then there's part of me that's like, Oh man, if somebody was like, do your hour tonight, like what the fuck would that look like? Oof, I would just, yeah. it's a little scary because I don't want to feel like the standup is getting too far, too far from me. Like it's always good to pivot and work on other stuff. Um, well, it's far from everybody though. So that was, that's what makes it easy is none of us are doing it. Like there's a couple of guys doing outdoor shows and sure this, but nobody is really propelled full. Like Chelsea Handler said she shot a, yeah, HBO exactly. Max thing, but I guess that was with certain distancing and people seated and like, yeah, that's great. I mean, but it, it's we're we're all kind of just milling about the fucking waiting area. We're, you know what I mean? We're all at the wedding, just kind of standing in that fucking hors d'oeuvre area, talking like oh. that's what everybody is basically doing right now. So we're yes. all in the same boat. Yeah, we're stuck in hors d'oeuvres right now, and it's mm -hmm. like, are we gonna fill up on hors d'oeuvres? Like, is dinner even coming at this point? Yeah. And if it does, will, will it be as good as I remembered it? Uh, I, I think so. I think it's the stand-up. It's going to be fun to go back on stage and not know what I'm doing. Like, you know, of course, you, you know, you're a comic. You know what you're doing. But to, to be rough with it again and bumble through it again, I'm not afraid. Of that. I, I can't wait to do that. Like, it's going to be fun to explore that. And what the fuck is it like to not have done comedy for six months? I've never done that in my career. It's great. That's really good. And that just speaks to like your true creativity because you embrace the messiness of discovery. And I think, you know, people who, who aren't oriented that way are more like, oh, I, this thing I can't control. Yeah. I, I lost my memorization. And um, so that's a really good way to look at it. It's like, okay, what can I discover again? It'll be fun. Yeah. yeah. To, to watch myself be a mess. Like I love telling jokes and, and trying stuff and talking through stuff on, uh, on stage and you know you want it to work but when it doesn't work sometimes it's fun and some you know it's okay either way so I, I just think that'll be a fun experience that everybody will be doing do you think you'll enjoy talking about like the lockdown and the stuff or do you feel like you'll be you know that you'll be sick of that a minimal amount i think it will be the type of thing where everybody will oh it's good to be out again like we'll all be saying the same thing and people will tolerate it for a little while but I don't think people are going to want to think too much about it just because it's boring. Like when everyone is done with it, we're going to be, you can, again, you have a couple of jokes on it. Sure. What did I do on the lockdown? You have some creative. Great. But you also, I didn't want to focus too much on doing stuff during this thing that I'm going to lose when it's, when it's over. Like you don't want to fall in love with a way of doing things during the lockdown that you're going to lose once we're back to, because we're going to go back. I mean, this is not going to be this way for you know, a year from now. We're not going to be just fucking zooming all the time. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, we're, the plan is not to drive on the spare tire for, right. for the rest of time. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
so many, <laughs> so many good metaphors. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think of like, man, it's like, how, how am I going to find like, or how are all comics going to find the balance between like connecting and being real and not bumming people out? Like, what are you going to be like? Oh, hey, who here got fired? Who lost their job? And then it's like, oh, wait, we're, we're here to like pump people up and, and unify and entertain. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, you know, I, I want to open up and go like, you know, look, I know we're all thinking like it was inconvenient, but I mean, I made as much money as I would have made if there wasn't a pandemic. I'm hoping you're all in the same. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Sorry, you guys uh, lost. It'd be fun business. to say that just to be obnoxious. It's not true, but it would just be fun to, to say that. But yeah, like. like ooh, I, what a good time to not have your own business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's ways to make it funny. And, and again, after 9-11, that was the fucking, that was the trick. How do we get back into making things funny? And eventually on the radio show on Opie and Anthony, we were talking for two weeks. We took phone calls. That, that show was never serious. It was always fucking nonsense. We took phone calls for maybe a month, maybe more. Wow. And we finally found an angle to make fun of, which was people were writing these emotional songs, which sucked. And so we would play these emotional songs about 9-11 and try to guess what the next rhyme was going to be. You know what I mean? Like, we'll never lose our power. Stop. Uh, towers or whatever it was going to be. And you would try to make fun of it through that. So there was a, it was kind of a way back in to making fun of things again, but not, but kind of addressing what was going on. You know what I mean? And it was a good target, which was these shitty songs, which everybody hated. Yeah, and it sounds like you found your way there organically instead of like, you know, forcing something. Oh, yeah. And that's what's yeah. like really great. I mean, that's what's so great. I mean, all of you are so great, but like Anthony too is like, he can, you know, he's, he can, he'll, he makes everybody look really good. And I feel like Opie was always good. Maybe more of a straight, would you describe him as being more of a straight man kind of, or more? Sure. Of, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think after a while he began to resent that role. Um, and, I, and I've said about him too, like, I, I don't hate him. You know, we're not friends anymore. But the reality is, is if he would have not been resentful of his role, he delivered yeah. things in, in a way. Like, I think that he just felt like he was being left out. And a big part of that was not being comfortable in the role he was in. But he was really great in that role when he was comfortable. Like when he was comfortable. And I, again, he'll deny this. But I, I, you know, just take it for what it's worth as to somebody who sat across from him. When he was comfortable. He was really fun to work with. He was funny. He was, um, he was an amazing at, at, at picking things out. Uh, you know, so many things on that show exploded because he found them and brought, like his mind worked really well that way. Um, whereas my mind doesn't work well that way. And Anthony's doesn't work particularly well that way. And that's not me being polite by saying that about him. It's the truth. And it, one of the things that made that show work. But when you start resenting your role, like I never resented my role as the third mic. But if I had started resenting my role and trying to set everything up on the opium, you would have been like, what the fuck is Jim doing? Like if I started to go, all right, listen, today we got, and you'd be like, what, what? All right, like once in a while, but not, it would look weird. Yeah. So it was, I think it was not, like he was listening to people who hated him and who said he didn't contribute on the show, but Anthony and I weren't saying that he would feel that in those weird moments. So I think that he listened to a lot of people on the outside that didn't understand that, yeah, it was an extremely important dynamic for the show. So I, I think that, yeah, he was definitely difficult to work with, but um, I, I think a lot of it was him losing faith in what his role was and how valuable it was. It almost feels like he started to view the three of you as like uh, like members of a band that where there is a defined front man or whatever, or the defined funny guy or the defined yeah. guy with the context when really he should have, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like hindsight is twenty twenty, but it's like, think of it more as an orchestra where you all like together have different parts and that's what makes it great is, you know, the different sections or whatever. Yeah, that's what makes, it's like if the drummer isn't playing, you really notice that he's not there. But if mm -hmm. the drummer tries to sing, you're like, what are you doing? But it doesn't mean that in, in a derogatory way to go, hey, you're not good enough to sing. It's just not what you do as well. Like, yeah, 
he's not as funny as me and Anthony. So what? Like, I'm not, again, big deal. Uh, I'm not as funny as Anthony. Like, I don't give a shit. Like, I, I work very well with him. And I think comedically we have great chemistry. Like, he's, I, I don't, you know, we, we just clicked in that way. We're both mean. We both laugh at barbarics. You know what I mean? It just worked. Yeah. Um, but so what? Like, it, 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 neither of us was as good at running a show. Uh, and that is not easy to do. I There's mean, nothing I, wrong with being a really good drummer. I mean, that's fantastic. The straight man is, is very underrated. Um, and I imagine, I understand why they, after a while, don't like that title or that role, because it seems like a second prize, but it's not. It's a necessary part of certain comedy performances. Nobody gives a shit about Costello without Abbott. Nobody just wants to see a guy go. <laughs> it was, the funny part was the frustration that the straight guy was feeling with him. Like the dynamic between them was critical. And without the straight guy, you have zero of that. So it's like, right. it's more, it's not just valuable as in here's your second prize. It's valuable as it's needed. You, it, the ball needs to bounce off of something or else it just goes and it doesn't make any kind of an impact. So yeah. have you spoken with Opie? Not in uh, the last time we spoke through text was maybe the day before our last show together. And that was it. And we may never wow. speak again. He walked past. We walked past each other in the gym one day, but that was it. We had no zero interaction. Zero. Could ask him to spot you. <laughs> like, hey, you go to the same gym. <laughs> Yeah, but I think we work out at different times because I've only seen him once there since wow. this whole thing we broke, since we stopped working together. How was that? Like, how did that last yeah, show feel? Deal. Did you yeah. know in advance it was the last show? Uh, oh, the last show. Yes, so he didn't show up for it. He took the day off, um, if I remember correctly. Um, we knew it was our last one. I wanted out. And I think he did too. I mean, you know, I make no bone. Of course, I wasn't that easy. I'm just self-aware enough to say I wasn't that easy. Um, you know, and... I was, we, we knew we were done and I was happy to be done. Yeah. Was yeah. there ever any talk of, you know, going to compound at all? You know, I, I thought about it, but it's serious is it, it's a machine and the money at serious is good. And I like the guests we can get at serious. And I've said it before. I, I always wanted Anthony to come back. Like I always wanted him to come. I mean, obviously he's not going to now, but um, yeah, I mean, it was definitely thought about, but you know, with serious, it's, it's a good way to make a living. I mean, the money was really, it is good. And, okay. and I had my own, my own thing with, um, with Sam. I, I don't know how long, you know, will we, will we go beyond this contract? I don't know. I mean, it's going well, we don't argue, we get along well. Um, so we have like another year left. And like, yeah, serious. <laughs> the last time I was there, they had like different flavored seltzers which I was like, wow, because they had some renovations and they fixed the whole like waiting area, which is really nice. The guests, a big part of it was the guests too. It's serious. You just get good, like a lot of guests because they're coming through. So you wind up get, you know, booking all the comedians you want and all the people you want. They, they just, it, it's just easier to get people because they're right there in the building. Most of our guests we probably wouldn't have gotten if they weren't already at Sirius. Yeah, it's like a, like celebrity high school almost. It's like, oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. What did you learn from Opie that helps you now with Sam? Hmm, good question. Um, have, what did I learn from him in, in, uh, in, I'll put it this way. Sam and I talk pretty often. Um, and, I, and there's not any real reason for it, but I've learned don't both just go your separate ways like not not we don't really, we, we haven't had any real issues i mean it's been pretty painless so i mean this show is easy compared to the one i was doing with him so um i know that i don't want to be the type of guy that other people at work are uncomfortable with. like i try to get along well with, with, with obviously with sam and travis and troy and i think those guys uh like me and like working with me but i, I don't want to be the type of guy that people are afraid to talk to if there's something they're not happy with yeah. I mean, that's, you know, one thing I would like is, is to be, uh, for them to all be comfortable coming to me if there's anything they want to talk about. Or, I had a guy, one of the guys called me recently with something. He's like, hey, man, I'm sorry about that thing. And I'm like, for what? Like, it was, it was perfectly, there was nothing to be sorry about. Like, you know, I don't want, I want people to be 
comfortable that I'm working with. How does uh, your dynamic with Sam compare to your dynamic with Opie? It's just much different. Sam was never my boss. I don't have, you know, Sam and I, I didn't have contract nightmares with Sam. Um, you know, the dynamic was different. Opie and I had just built up resentment. I don't have that with Sam. Like, we came into it differently. We came into it like, well, do we want to do this or do we? Because I knew I was leaving regardless. So when I came into it with Sam, um, I didn't plan on Sam originally. I think Travis was the guy I was talking about first because Sam had a night show. But um, it's just a painless show compared to the last one because I know that I don't have a boss. You know, like if Sam and I have pretty much equal say on that show. I mean, I, there's not, I'm not, I couldn't just dictate shit and he couldn't just dictate shit. We kind of have to come to an agreement on something, which is nice. Um, I know that ultimately neither of us is the boss and that's a different dynamic. It, it makes things different when you're communicating. Do you ever have guests that you have on because like Sirius XM is like, oh, this person's promoting this thing, just have them on. Or is it mostly like you guys can pretty much choose? You know, I can't think of anybody that they forced on us. Uh, I mean, they would never force anybody. Um, but, you know, over the years with publicists, that happens. Not with Sirius XM, that will happen with publicists where, well, if you take so-and-so, you get this one. And uh, I think that's fairly common. Um, but sometimes I'm sure it's people we would have taken anyway, who we, who we yeah. liked anyway. Is there anybody in particular you're thinking of? I'll tell you. No, no. I okay. just was wondering, like, like maybe workings of, of Sirius or, like, um, hold on. Maybe there is someone who... Oh, Nancy Grace? Oh, that was just an argument. I mean, she oh. came in to promote something. And Nancy Grace was one. That was like Sam and I's second show, and she walked out. That was the second show? Whoa. But I had blasted her so many times on Twitter because I think that she was capitalizing on dead kids. And she came in, and we were giving her an interview. And I think she recognized my name because she was a little shitty. But I said to her, I forget how I said it, but I was like, I have to be honest with you. And I, and I told her that I had been critical of her. Because I think it was, I can't be a fucking little twat and do it. And then when she's there, not say it. Like to me, that yeah. just feels cowardly. That's so I had to say it, but I wasn't attacking her. And then of course, being a victim, she was like, I felt like she was ambushed, but she wasn't. I didn't sit there and go, you fucking bitch. I just told her how I felt like, and that's your job. That's kind of what you do. So um, yeah, I don't like Nancy Grace. Um, but they, yeah, she was booked just doing a boat. And we were going to give her a reel. She walked out. We didn't throw her out. And then Sam took her to task on some uh, wrestling stuff, which I wasn't aware of. He, he knew what he was talking about with that. I didn't I had no idea. Yeah, it's kind of like your job to be like, okay, we're here. We have the airtime. Like, what's going to make, make this worth it? You know? Yeah. Like, and, and by the way, if you're hashtagging tot mom, mm -hmm. I mean, come on. Don't act like you're not. Don't act like you're not making it a thing. Hashtag yeah. tot mom. What, to get a buzz going about the murdered kid? I mean, come on. It's what you're doing. Yeah, anyone who tries to get a hashtag going, uh, yeah, it's a little lame. Although I did try to get the hashtag going of Chrissy Teigen blocked me, so I think I am. Oh, did she block you? Part of that group, yeah, she did. She oh, no. blocked me. I was part of that like million person block. Um, it was like a month ago when I was like, "Hey, you deleted thirty thousand tweets," and then she responded like, "Actually, it's sixty thousand." Because you're a crazy conspiracy theorist, and I'm worried for my family. And I don't oh. know, but she had a bunch of like creepy tweets or whatever. Um, but we're good now. We made up. No, I'm definitely still blocked. Okay. Uh, <laughs> are you at all open to an Opie and Anthony reboot or even like a you know a yearly charity event? Would you consider? Something we don't like, like that? each other. Like <laughs> the reality is this. No, I don't care about that. Like, I, I mean, Anthony um, is one of my closest friends. Opie and I stopped lock, liking each other. So it's like, and, and I don't think him and Anthony, like, I, I, I have no desire. But again, I don't hate the guy. It's not like, fuck, there's not some visceral, I wish him poorly. I really don't. Like, I, you know, good, he's doing a podcast. Hey, whatever, listen to it. I hope it works. I mean, I don't want to see the guy not do what he wants. But I have no desire to interact with him. I don't care about interacting with him. Uh, if there was a charity event and it happened, all right, I guess so, but I'm not, it's probably never going to happen. Um, but again, I'm still extremely close to Anthony. He's one of my, yeah. again, he's one of the people I talk to more than anybody. Do you think Opie like self-sabotaged a lot? 
You know, I, I guess as a person, he very possibly did, sure. I mean, he, he got, because uh, look, anybody can get fired. So I don't, you know, we can all fuck up and get fired. I, I don't begrudge anybody. Like, I don't, I don't think anybody's a complete idiot in this climate if they get fired because it's very easy to get fired. But um, yeah, I think he has that bug in him. But I think I have that bug in me too. I have just learned to really be aware of it. Like, on, on, here's an example, on Twitter. I, I, so many times I've wanted to respond to things people have written. I'm just perusing Twitter. I read something yesterday. I was like looking up something. I wasn't even signed in. I literally read Twitter when I'm not signed in, check, reading about, like, I think it was Falwell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like a news and, source. Yeah, like, because there are things on there that make sense. And I, I wanted to, a part of me was like, I want to fucking, and I'm like, no one's talking to me. But, mm -hmm. oh, no, you know what it was? It was a thread about something where some anchor had said something, and two, they were fighting about, so it was either race or gay rights. And I'm like, they're not talking to me. So what mm -hmm. the fuck am who get my, fuck you, Jim, mind your business. Like, that's what I'm talking about. I, 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 I know myself well enough to know that I have that nosy instinct and I have to practice what I preach. Like if I tell a joke and people who are not following me are like, I didn't really go fuck yourself. I wasn't talking to you. Well, it's an open conversation. Shut up. Mind your business. Stay over there. Block me. Um, but I don't want to be guilty of doing that. So I kind of have to practice it. And I do practice it. I don't go and fucking, you know, oh, I didn't like that you said that. If you're talking about something that doesn't concern me at all. Uh, that's part of the problem with our stupid culture is everybody is so fucking nosy. And everybody is so fucking obsessed with being heard and being right and getting a round of applause. Oh, oh boy, that was good that you said that. That we, all we do is just we go after what other people are saying and we attack them. So, so I've tried to avoid that, I guess is my point. So am I self-destructive? Uh, forgive my long answer. Yes, but I, I think I'm self-aware enough, aware enough to avoid a lot of the traps I almost step in. Doesn't mean I won't ever, but I've avoided a lot of them. Yeah, what helps me when my brain is taking me down that path, I look at the, what I'm reading and I go, is, this per is it possible that this person is writing this not specifically to tick me off? You know, like I always consider like, sure, they're probably not trying to piss me off, me specifically with this, but you know, that's if you have a minute of, you know, not reacting right away. And like, yeah, speaking of being nosy, it seems that fans and trolls uh, seem to be obsessed with your sexuality and, you know, sexual preferences. It just seems sure. like that's a thing that people, you know, fans like to talk about a lot well i've left myself open to that too i mean i've talked about it i've talked about so much stuff um sexually that i've kind of left myself open to those questions sure but i haven't left many questions i don't think i think i've been pretty forthcoming yeah all right i didn't know if that like stuff like bothered you or you felt like people uh, no and, and when they get it wrong i and they do often eh, who cares like it it's not what am I going to do? Correct everybody who's wrong? I don't care if they get it. Like, um, I've been more truthful than most people. Um, not everybody, but, and I don't say that as a virtuous thing. It's just kind of what I've used to make myself funny. I mean, or I've used it as jokes and I've worked through my own shit that way. Like a lot of times you work through your stuff on stage. Um, what does this mean to me? What am I doing? And, and you wind up just saying things that turn out to be funny and they also feel truthful, yeah. which is maybe one of the reasons that they're funny is people sense that you're being, I don't know. But yeah, no, I mean, look, uh, people are invasive sometimes, but you know, from people who are uh, trolls, eh, whatever. I mean, who cares? And I mean that sincerely, like they, I know that most of them are not as open with their stuff as I've been. Not, half of them are not even using their real identities. So if they get it wrong, they get it wrong. Yeah. And I, I find that the people that are the most judgmental are the ones that like, yeah, maybe they align more so with you, but they're just afraid of putting it out there, making it public, afraid what the people around them will think, or it's like, oh, I've been married 20 years. I can't yeah. admit that I, you know, liked a woman who happened to have a penis. Happened to have a penis. I happen to be also attracted sure. to that too, or whatever, like in, in, anything in between, like, I interviewed Buck Angel, who was, he's like famously, you know, called like the man with a, with a pussy. And he, yeah. you know, transitioned from like female, female to male. To male. Yeah. I'm like, he's a good looking dude. And I just forget. I'm like, hey, you also have a vagina. I'm like, that might be interesting. 
You know, the, in, the most, the interactions that do mean something to me, uh, I get most of them are private. They're DMs or like what either on Instagram or most or, or emails. People don't normally say this publicly is that they go like, you know, I really appreciate you talking about that. You don't know how normal you've made me feel. Or you don't know how much like I thought about that. And then I hear you talking about it so casually, it makes me feel like, yeah, it's okay. Like I've gotten hundreds of those over the years. Wow. And again, I don't read them over the air or talk about like, you know, but I mean, those are fairly frequent. I've gotten them from the radio show, from stand up. So that's why when people get it wrong, I don't really give a shit because enough people have contacted me privately. Because again, they're not going to say that stuff publicly. They're not going to, you know, unless it's, you know, um, again, under a name that's not them. But a lot of people just like, hey, thank you for talking about what you uh, talk about because it makes me feel like more okay with myself. And that always makes me feel nice. Because again, that's not, that's just a private interaction from somebody who was affected in a good way. So yeah, that's not the goal of me talking about it. I mean, I just, I want to be funny, but it, it, I'm happy that it affects people that way sometimes. Yeah. And then think about all the people who want to thank you, who don't have the nerve to write to you and all the people that you're positively affecting who you'll just like never meet, never know about. Yeah. And so many people, and again, I don't, it's not like I, I'm out to do that. I, I just feel like by talking about certain things or certain experiences, especially in your childhood or when, when people hear it vocalized or verbalized, a lot of times if it's something taboo, they feel better about it. And that's, that's kind of, I guess, a side benefit. I mean, the benefit for me is it's, it gets it, a laugh. It's my job to be, and it feels like therapeutic for me to, to spit it out. Um, I had a girl one time try to blackmail me over like, like our sexual texts or whatever. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Like everybody, go ahead. Like it was crazy. <laughs> like, what are you going to be slightly embarrassed? Who gives a shit? Like, um, you know, you get that once in a while, uh, but it's a relief to not worry about it. Wait, was someone trying to me to you about a text? No, no, no. This is not even a me too thing. This was just embarrassing. It wasn't like, oh. you know, no, there was no victim. It was just a, a, a like, she's like, I, I'd be embarrassed. Like, this is fairly innocuous shit. Yeah. No, I wouldn't be embarrassed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And even if I would, like nobody, even if I would have some embarrassment, okay, I'd have some embarrassment. I would live. Yeah. And it's good to like, let somebody know. It's like, you don't have that kind of power over me. And like, well, a guy like Falwell, it's funny when you watch this whole Jerry Falwell thing, like that's a different, like that's a tortured way to live. And like, I, I, it's hard to feel bad for the guy when they've done nothing, but basically say oh, other people shouldn't do what they want. And they make a living saying that you're wrong for doing this stuff. And then apparently if he's watching guys fuck his wife, but he's really done nothing wrong. I mean, no. there's nothing wrong with wanting somebody to fuck your wife and you watch. Go ahead. I mean, you think I don't get the cuck boy in the corner angle? I fucking get, that's cuck 101. I mean, I just <laughs> sits in the corner. Of course he does. What else are you supposed to do? You know, I-, I Why do you think I bought so much popcorn? You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're also supposed to jerk off while you're fucking my wife in the corner. <laughs> it's so not shameful to yeah. me at all to like that. I get why the fucking president of Liberty University can't admit that, but like that's gotta be a hard way to live. To have yes. that demon- and to want to watch guys fuck your wife and to be so worried that somebody will say, I fucked his wife. Yeah, for a kind of a mainstream kink. You know, it's not like, oh, I really like to have right. someone come in my mouth and then I pass that to another person and we pass it back. I mean, like, yeah. the more I um, interview porn stars and like, therefore, the more porn I watch, the more I'm like, oh, the shit I'm into is like not even scratching the surface. In terms of like, what is even, I mean, nothing's weird. Everything's, you know, pretty much natural, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, like, you dom, sub, cucking. Like, you know, it's all, it's all like in the age of the internet and getting whatever you want pornographically, it becomes harder and harder to find. Like, when I was growing up, it was like magazines. Like, you would look at a fucking magazine and get turned on. Like, like I remember seeing a catalog. Yeah, yeah a I was no catalogs never did it for me. That I was I I came after the catalog. Anthony's from the catalog era. Yeah, he's I catalog am, era. Anthony's a fucking catalog jerker. I'm not a catalog <laughs> jerker. I'm a fucking. You know, Anthony could fucking jerk to a J.C. Penny. I I needed nudity, but like uh like seeing Pia Zadora in Wee Magazine or fucking mm. uh, when Vicky Lamada did Playboy like. Oh yeah. These were really really. Uh, 
but you know, that was enough to make you come when you were that age. And then as you get older and you start watching it, you need a little bit more, you know, so it gets a little harder to satisfy. God, for me, not like I would masturbate to it. Cause I was a very late masturbator. Like I didn't even attempt to masturbate till I was like almost done with college. I think it was like 20 or 21. I was like, well, let's give this a whirl. And it was like also nothing, but I really liked looking at like Abercrombie and Fitch, like the black and white, like the catalogs and the posters, I'd be like, Ooh, that's a man, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and then you meet the guys who work there and you're like, Oh, you, you work at a mall. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And you don't like women. Yeah. <laughs> you're, okay. you're like, all right, I'll try Hollister. I'll try uh, banana Republic. Yeah. So I don't know. It's gotten, uh, it's gotten harder to, to find things that feel new with sex. So you have to just kind of, I've, I've literally mellowed so much in the last few years, but a part of that's just getting older too. Like, you know, when you hit 50, you think different. It's just a part of life. You think different. There's not anything that any, you don't mean to think different. You just do like, it's not as important to me as it used to be. And I never thought I'd say that, but after a while you're like, all right, what am I going to do? How many ways can I come? Like I've come, you know, mostly on me. Uh, it's mostly alone. <laughs> Um, but none of it feels good anymore. Like none of it feels like just a regular blowjob feels great. Like, you know, you, you don't need any of the other crazy stuff with it. Uh, the bells and the whistles and the more you lay off that stuff, the more the regular stuff feels good again. The classics. Yeah. It's always classics. Good to, like, yes. Go back to the classics. Like I did this last year, but I'm doing it this year too. I like, didn't you, I haven't used my vibrator for the whole month of August and it's like, yeah, you're like, oh yeah, like regular sex feels like fucking amazing again. I, I have to maybe stop killing myself with a lawnmower every other yeah. day. You know? <laughs> yeah, you start because you get desensitized. For me, like like I, I I pretty much have stopped jerking off. And it's weird because like it becomes such a fuck. It's like checking Twitter. The constant <sighs> state of of like a weird chemical being put mm. in your brain, a constant state of edging. And feeling uncomfortable and not feeling, it's really a crazy way to be. When you don't do it for a little while, you're like, fuck, man, that really, I always felt off uh, because I was doing that. Like I was never in a, a calm state because I was just You felt all day. off because you were always thinking about the next time you're going to masturbate or you felt that right after you were done? Or I would both, or I would jerk off and then stop because I knew once I came, I was back to reality. So I would jerk off and, and then I'll say, ah, fuck, I'll be stopping, just go to the cellar and do a set. And I would just stop. I wouldn't even come. I'd just go do a set and then come back. Like it was like this long session by myself. It was like it really old man lonely shit. Um, so I recently I've kind of stopped just doing that. Like, and then the audience at the cellar is like, "Why is Jim hard on stage?" Yeah. Right now? <laughs> Why does he keep licking his fingers? What's he fucking he must doing? Really be enjoying the set. He, he must think he's killing. <laughs> yeah, but that's another reason I fucking put weight on too, because like you, you got to do something. So like you know, and I and I figure the weight will come off. But it's one of those things where that thing whatever that thing is you know what i mean like you it's just that thing you yeah it, it, you can get into like obsessive thinking or like just w w whatever your focus is and just yeah. like hyper focusing and it's like yeah i don't know if, i mean i don't know if knitting is the answer yeah it's tricky yeah it's, well knitting would be great but i would rather just fucking shove keto chocolate into my i'm so fucking delusional i'm convinced that if i eat keto chocolate i won't get fat but i'm still eating carbs so it's stupid it's like i'm not doing the keto diet is I'm the keto no chocolate similar? Because I was on, I've been on every single diet ever. And I was on the, Ak I would do it often with my mom and we would like compare. Um, but we were on the Atkins diet and there was Atkins chocolate. Is that similar to keto chocolate? Where it's I don't, like, no keto part? chocolate you can get at, um, oh God, uh, Costco. Okay. Or like those type places. So uh, I don't know what Atkins chocolate, uh, chocolate tastes. I never, I never had Atkins chocolate. That was a long time ago. Yeah, I never had it. And then there was South Beach Diet where they're like, oh, yeah. your, your treat is this chocolate cheese. Like you get this ricotta cheese and then you put cocoa dust on it and that's supposed to be your dessert. Oh, like, sounds awful. Yeah, I'd be throwing back like cartons and cheese. You're like, what is my life? Yeah, that sounds yeah. awful. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Pretty, pretty gross. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I hope, God, that's, I mean, if Cirrus is saying January, I mean, Broadway's just, out for the rest of the year. Broadway's finished, yeah. But that's just to be cautious. Like, there's no need for them to rush because most of us, uh, as, you know, James Altucher said, we're doing this stuff on Zoom, and it's not as good. I mean, obviously, I have a microphone. I have 
a processor. I have like good equipment. Like Sirius gave me professional equipment. So I have pretty much the same mic. Cause Sam is, Sam is a bunker in his house. So he has a great setup and I have the same equipment set up as he has. So we have professional studio equipment. And it's amazing to like, you sound really good. Whatever you're using. Oh, thank you. Sounds very good. Oh, you do have a mic. See, is that, is that it's, the, uh, it's a blue. It's, um, a, a Yeti. Yeti. Yeah. It's a Yeti blue. And, uh, yeah. And I waited in line. This was like, yeah, obviously just a couple months ago in at the target in the Bronx and I was, I was in the rain and they're like, you know, they're like, are you a microphone girl? You're waiting to pick up your microphone. I guess like no one had ever ordered a microphone from the target <laughs> in the Bronx before, but like, since I had waited an hour, he knocked off like 15 bucks. So it was like oh, nice. 110 or something. And it's, yeah, I use it every day. So sounds good. And you'd be surprised how many comedians don't have, I'm like, you're like, we're five months into this and some guys still are just kind of talking into their mat. Like, what are you doing? No headphones. You're just yelling at your phone. Yeah. Your computer even like you're not even, I, I'm not saying you gotta have a professional hookup, but how do you not have one thing that you can USB into the fucking computer? Yeah. And it's accessible. And like, I've been meaning to get like real headphones, like what you have. Um, but I worry if it's going to like mess up my hair, but I probably. No, what you have is fine. By the way, when I would do chip, I have to use because, you know, Chip uh, likes a hat. He likes uh, a hat. These, I, I use these fucking, uh, but they're not great. These, they're bows, but they sound tinny and like shit, but I can hear with them. Uh, but what I'm wearing now is just amazing. I mean, you're not going to get any better than just regular studio headphones. Yeah. What a boring podcast guest I am. No, I was, I was in my mind thinking, is this No, is but I'm like, what am I doing? Do a, I was thinking, I was like, do I... I was thinking, is there a pun using the word bows? I was like, am I going to say bows before bros, bros before bows? And then I was like, no, Chris, you probably don't say any of those things. None of those are funny <laughs> enough. So that's, that's what's happening over <laughs> okay, there. Okay, I understand. <laughs> Fucking bows, where are the arrows? Gag, Chrissy, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should do chip again. Um, yeah. it's, uh, I, I do it once a week. So, uh, you know, if you want, I think I'm taping Thursday. I usually tape Thursdays if you're available. Oh, you awesome. Do it. Love to have you. What time usually? Well, I can talk later. But. Usually 7.30 normally. Oh, sweet. I might be around. I, I literally have built it around a schedule that Anthony can um, accommodate. I try that's to get good. Anthony on whenever I can. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Jim, where can people find you? You know, where, where can they check out your stuff if they for some reason haven't before? <laughs> Here's where they can go. The chip chipperson.com. The new merch store is up. Chip is selling a lot of shirts and mugs and there's other stuff going on sale too. It's been really fun. Like again, creatively, you just keep focusing on different things so we don't jump off a balcony. So that's <laughs> what I've been doing for like the last two weeks. I've been just like putting merch together and getting it designed and now it's up for sale and more shit will be going up for sale. And, um, and Patreon, Chip, chipperson.com, Patreon. I do, a lot of, I do a lot of Zoom hangs. I do them as me. I do them as Chip. It depends. Sometimes I just don't feel like putting the fucking glasses on. So I'll just go in, but the fans like it when you just kind of go in and hang out for an hour and just talk. It's fun to talk to 50 or 60 fans in a Zoom chat. So it, it, they can find me there, Patreon for Chip or Jim and Sam or, you know, Twitter, I'm not on much. Is Chip on Cameo? Love it. I like every other comedian. I first heard about Cameo, I'm like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. And then I just decided to do it like last uh, Thanksgiving. I'm like, fuck it. It'll be a extra money. And it's really fun. I do it as me too. No one gives a shit. <laughs> um, I, 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 I literally will do one for every 20 that chip gets and Edgar gets none. Edgar has done maybe 20 in almost a year. Nobody wants a cameo from Edgar Mellencamp, but, uh, yeah, as chip, I do them and it's fun. And I do them as myself too, but, uh, Hey, look, we're not doing gigs. Why not? Extra stuff, you know, any extra yeah. income. And it's again, if people want it, like they can still, everything I do can pretty much be seen for free. Um, with, at least with Chip. The podcast is free just a week late on YouTube. Um, the animations are free. They're up. So, you know, that's one. If you want it, you get it. That's awesome. Yeah. Jim, thank you so much. This was Thank great. you. Sorry I started showing you equipment. Oh, I really no, should work okay. on my guest skills. <laughs> Thanks.